value of the group conversion the group conversion moment had some major values even though the reason for this moment varied from one place to another in this section i would like to deal with some of the major values of the group conversion among the indian subcontinent in general the value can be said that the group conversion give protection especially viewed from the perspective of the high caste brahmins the sense of social security and belongingness was major value the second value may be noted as the main center of influence in group conversion of the community a tribe is the feeling of belongingness so when a particular tribe or community converted the group conversion news had been spread fast and for which enable the nearby villages of the tribal group are the same members of the community to embrace christianity and for the third value there was less impact of western culture in group conversion areas the best example can be seen in the group conversion of chin kuki misos in mesoram and manipur the first convert or individual converted into christianity by those missionaries who forsook their own culture and custom and practices and even avoided all the traditional norms and festival thinking that all those practices are pagan and non christians thus the cultural and traditional values begin in the life of those early converts among the tribal however with the coming of revival in the later part of the 19th century group conversion took place and almost all the tribes of mizoram and manipur were christianized the coming of group conversion had a great value in the life of tribal of those areas as they realized the need of the cultural values and adopted the traditional tribal voice of worship and maintained their own social structure cultural practices and use of the tribal drums and other tribal musical instru- instrument in their uh, worship service thus it preserved the tribal ways of life and tribal community was given birth problem of mass conversion the mass movement among the backward classes has left a stigma over the christian church among the higher castes these missions are seen as exploited of the needs of the weaker sections of communal purpose the mass movement therefore would she will be criticized from both the non christians and christian side for the motives in fact the motive of mass conversion to christianity can be listed down variously manikin says the converts to christianity came with a mix motives and the motives of one individual were not identical with those of another tb philip commented that the motives for conversion were not always purely religious it involves many external factors but it is a mistake to think that such motives alone caused conversion however for better or worse the mass movement have occurred it is an interesting issue the chief numerical growth of christianity in the 19th and 20th centuries was not by the conversion of individual but mass movement from mission to church the establishment of british rule in india cemented the way for real encounter between the east and the west and between christianity and indian culture tremendous changes and transformation took place with the onset of british rule which gave the imputes for the foundation of modern india the outcome of the encounter was revival renewal and renaissance of indian culture and the starting of religious and political nationalism western liberal and nationalistic ideas imparted through western education 
and the Christian social activities played an important role in the 19th century Indian Renaissance. Awakening also had its share in Indian politics, arts, literature and thought. Ancient literature, philosophy, science, law, art and monuments which were buried in oblivion for years were raised to life. Here, zeal for enlightenment and love of the country developed in the minds of the people. It is better to be noted that the Orientalists in their philosophy of culture suggested that the changes must not be attempted in India by imposing Indian Western institution, ideas and values, but held that Western education should not serve as an end in itself, but as a stimulus for changing the indigenous culture from within. Both the Orientalist and like-minded Indian or Indian recognized that they were blameworthy and the outcome of superstition. However, they also pointed that this did not find precedence or section in the ancient traditions of the land and this helped them to reform the society without repudiating their own tradition. According to S.K. Das, there were three chief features of the Indian Renaissance. They are a spirit inquiry, a search for new identity as nation, and desire to make a synthesis between the value of Indian and Europe. Development of Indigenous Movement There was a missionary movement identified Christ with Western forms of Christianity and Western culture. Very soon, there were an inclusion, leaders and missionary pioneers who distinguished between Christ, Christianity and culture. It is everything today at the beginning of missionary movement. But it was not to establish an indigenous church, but to save souls from Hathen. The emergence of Indian church in its context was hindered due to missionary paternalism. By the 19th century, there were some effort to build up an indigenous church independent of missionary control. For example, Lal Bihari Dey in 1850s asked for equal footing with the European missionaries. However, Alexander Duff did not approve this. The desire for equality, selfhood and independence from foreign mission control resulted in the formation of non-denominational organization of Indian Christians that reflect the search for identity and autonomy. But for many years, missionaries as a ruler opposed such movement. A leading CMS missionary, James Vaughan, at the Allahabad Conference in 1872, expressed seriously over the attitude of Indian Christians towards the missionary power, particularly in Bengal. He warned that as long as the church in India was economically independent upon, dependent upon European funds, it would be more proper for them to display passions with regard to independence, selfhood of the Indian church. On aspect of Indianization that has received attention since the end of the 19th century, was the effort to discover the cultural identity of the Christian community with the, with the Indian society as a whole. This expression was found in gradual introduction of, of Indian music and Indian lyrics in worship and indigenous style in church structure. Methods of proclaiming Christ in Tenevali, a group of Nadar Christians, broke away from the CMS and formed the Hindu Church of Lord Jesus in 1853. In Bengal, under the leadership of Lal Bihari, they started a movement against the 
exclusive missionary control of the church and he later brought a proposal for National Church of Bengal comprising all Christians including Orthodox and Roman Catholics. The only confession of which should be the Apostolic Creed and we should give freedom in matter of ministry and liturgy. Educated Christians thus formed the Bengal Christian Association in 1869 for the promotion of Christian truth and godliness and the protection of the right of the Indian Church. Some leaders of the radical groups like Kali Charan Banerjee in 1880 started a newspaper called the Bengal Christian Herald and his co-editor was Joy Gobind Shon. Typically of the view of the paper was the statement in the very first issue, in having become Christians, we have not ceased to be Hindus. We are Hindu Christians, as thoroughly Hindu as Christians. We have embraced Christianity, but we have not discarded our nationality. We are as intentionally national as any of our brethren of native praise can be. Later, Banarji and Shom left their churches to form the Christo Samaj of Calcutta in 1887. Indian Christians in Madras formed the National Church of Madras in 1886. Its founder was an Indian medical doctor as Parani Andy or Pulni Andy. Its aim was to gather all Christians into one self-supporting and self-governing church. These movements were short-lived, but their impact and influence were great, culminating to search for cultural identity of Christian community. Self-support, self-government, and self-propagation of Indian church. During the 20th century, the Indian Christian came up for the self-support, self-government, and self-propagation, free from foreign missionaries. Two institutional expressions in the 20th century, Protestant Christians are the National Missionary Society of India and the Christian Ashram Movement. V. S. Azharya and 17 other representatives from different churches in India met and constitute the NMS. This was an intern denominational society supported by Indian money, operated by Indians, though it would not refuse offer of help from other countries and committed as far as possible to follow indigenous method. The ordination and elevation of V.S. Azharia as the first Anglican Indian bishop in 1912 was a great event in the history of Christianity in India. The main objective of NMS was to evangelize the unevangelized area in India and neighboring, and neighboring countries and to stimulate missionary zeal in the churches. In 1950, it claimed to have 41 missionaries and 200 other workers and a budget of 1,30,000. In particular, there came a great awareness of the church and a shift of emphasis from mission to church so that the evangelization of India was no longer seen as a primarily the task of missionary societies, whether foreign or Indian, but as a function of ordinary church in its various regions and through its normal organs. The Indianizing and strengthening of this, rather than the development of other organization on the fringe of it, it became predominant aim. Ashram seems to be an institution which Christians could use to express their religious ideas in a way which Indian would readily appreciate. The idea of a life 
of retirement and meditation is familiar to Indian mind and has a considerable popular appeal. On the other hand, Catholic Christianity too has its tradition of the religious life lived in communities and orders, whether in monasteries or in the world. Ashram offers something more distinctively Indian and something capable of local adaptation in a great variety of ways. The ashram way of life and work, modeled as it was on the Hindu ashrams of ancient and modern times provided unanswered to Indian Christians who were looking for a ways of Christian witness and service in keeping with the tradition of Indian spirituality. It is very interesting that Christian ashram movement exists even today in different parts of the country. Except in certain areas there had been little attempt to build up self-governing institution. Here and there in distinguished individual had been brought into a position of leadership and authority. But such men ranked as assistant missionaries that is to say, they were regarded as organs of the foreign missionary society rather than the Indian church. This remained broadly the state of affairs up to the time when Bishop Azharia was consecrated in 1912. However, after the 1914-1918 to 1918 war, missionary societies came to realize that their business was not to strengthen and perpetuate their own organizations but to foster the Indian church and prepare it to take full responsibility of its own life and work. And all the other missions were giving their minds to this kind of policy in the year between 1999 and 1947. In 1867, the CMS in Tinevelli made a beginning when a system of district church council was introduced at the example of Henry Ben. These councils were local bodies, representative of the churches of particular areas within the whole Tinevelli district. They were responsible of controlling funds, supporting their catches, preparing their buildings and providing for the poor. The process of Indianizing was more rapid among the American Methodists than among the British. Historical Development of Indian Christian Theology In the 19th century, there were numerous confusion to the Christian Gospel as it was seen as manipulation of the Western formulation. The idea was that the gospel or the message was the translation of Western doctrines into Indian languages. Even the missionaries had a very negative attitude toward the native people and its culture. As a result of this attitude did not create condensive space for positive encounter or for the development of Indian Christian theology. Concentrated efforts were being made by missionary theologians like G. N. Francois, Nicole Manicole, and A. G. Hall towards communicating the gospel in the languages of India or using Indian philosophical categories. By the onset of 20th century, attempts were made to indianize the theology. Indian Christian theology in this venture, the work of the Madras Rethinking Group in the 1930s and 1940s need to be appreciated. On the other hand, Renaissance Hindu leaders like Keshi Sen, P.C. Majumdar, and enlightened Hindu converts to Christianity like K.M. Banerjee, Parani Andy, A.S. Appashami Palai, Bhavani Charan Banerjee, who possessing a true knowledge of Hinduism from within and drawing 
in separation from Renaissance discovery of Indian heritage, became a pinoy in attempt to relate positively Indian's religion to Christianity. Brahma Bandha Upadhya is the best remembered as the first Indian Christian thinker who remained orthodox in doctrine but at the same time laid the foundation for Vedanta-based Christian theology. Savaltan theology Savaltan theology is the theology of the suffering, oppressed and marginalized people who were forced to be silent by the dominant group. The term Savaltan is derived from the writings of the Italian Marxist Antonio Gramsci which means of inferior rank, whether of class, caste, age, gender, or office. In line with this, Ranjit Kuha also termed the word subaltern as people of inferior rank, and it was used as a name for the general attitude of subordinate in South Asia society. Specific groups belonging to subaltern classes may vary from place due to the regional display in social and economic development in the country. However, subaltern classes usually refers to those social classes and groups who are not included under the dominant group. Subaltern is a post-colonial struggle movement in Asia, which began in India in the 1980s with the explicit but not exclusively Marxist and Gramscian focus. It emerged in atmosphere of widespread negative response to Marxist, Marxian orthodox in the academic research in analyzing and understanding the Indian society and the nation. It focused towards understanding peasants consciousness in India. In so far as any and all consciousness was a product of material conditions, these subaltern theologians and writers view consciousness as a form of subjectivity which can and thus develop modes of residence to the system. Since then, the concern of subaltern studies have blossomed into global phenomenon with strong institution support from mainstream academy in Africa, America, Ireland and China as well as India and Europe. The contribution of subaltern movement is the restoration of the silent space created by dominant and dominant group to make subaltern classes the subject of their history. Subaltern studies take the text seriously and therefore advocating a different theory of reading. Example, the reading historical text and reconstructing history and theology from their own perspectives. Development of Dalit theology. Dalit theology is a new stand which has emerged in Asian theological sense. This theology began to take shape in the early 80s when A.P. Nirmal then a faculty member at the United Theological College floated the idea of Shudra theology. But now Dalit theology has come of age and it stands by its own uniqueness and creativity. Dalits are the most degraded, downtrodden, exploited and the least educated in Indian society. In fact, they are the people who are denied of their individuals and social identity in their existence. They are excluded from the caste system and hence are outcast as untouchables. The untouchables. They are pushed out of population, made to live in outskirts of village, hence segregated. Although Dalit Christians constitute approximately 70% of the Indian Christian population, they were marginalized and ignored until recently. A series of attempts and initiatives began in the early 80s to systematically articulate the faith in context of the newly emerging Dalit aspiration for liberation. A.P. Nirmal 
जेम्स मैसी एम ई प्रभाकर एम अजहरिया के विल्सन वी देवाश्याम एंड एफ जी बालाशुद्रम आर सम ऑफ द प्रोमिनेंट पर्सन हु फिगर इन दिस थियोलॉजिकल मोमेंट Dalit theologians felt the need to consciously reflect upon the oppressive situation of Dalit in India. Thus, essentially Dalit theology was a liberative action in itself, in the sense that its coming into being created shape for the development of a Dalit Christian voice. One of the major sources of doing Dalit theology is Dalit experience of suffering and pain. and dalit theology gives vent to the agony and pain of god's people the ultimate function of dalit theology is twofold to act in solidarity and to act for liberation liberation is envisaged as liberation of dalit from the historical oppressive structures both religious culture and socio economic hence theological articulation is not only a faith experience but also a means for liberation according to this school of thought any theological expression that will not lead to action and the resultant liberation is futile dalit theology theology is part of the post colonial struggle of different communities for their distinct identity and shape space development of tribal theology the word tribe or tribal is used in a very generic term incorporating a vast number of minor races john friedel defines tribe as a confederation of group who recognize relationship with another usually in form of common ethnic origin common language or strong pattern of interaction based on intermarriage or presumed kinship in indian context the term tribal has a sense of pejorative negative and derogatory connotations it suggests primitive people living in the hills and forest backward and uncivilized people who are the original but not developed inhabitants history points the majority of the christians in india come from the tribes dalit who are oppressed section in the society the history would never be complete unless taking into account the experience and aspiration of these people the term tribal theology and its cognates became popular when it was introduced as a formal theological discipline in theological college and seminaries tribal theology has a formal theological discipline of course a recent development and phenomenon the development of tribal or indigenous theology can be traced back to the later part of the 1980s and the early part of the 1990s when tribal theologians such as nirmal means renthi kaitsar Ethers down, followed by K. Thanswaba, Wati Lakshar, and other, began to look theology from the perspective of tribal people. Of course, to to a large extent, in Northeast India, Wati Lakshar and Thanswaba are responsible for the shaping and development of tribal theology. Development of feminist theology. The term feminist is used today for describing those who seek to eliminate women's subordination and marginalization. In the same line, I. P. Singh asserted that feminism is an awareness of women oppression and exploitation at work, within the family and society, and conscious action by women and men to change this situation and uplift. the life of women in not sir it reflects on the struggle of women created by exclusion untold experience and alienation in male dominated structures and its primary commitment is women's liberation there is also a strong assumption in modern thinking that the histories 
were written mostly by men from their perspective making it is making it as invisible contribution status and place of women in the history hence advocating for rewriting and rereading the historical texts secular historians in india like kumkum sanghani janki nair gayatri spivak suzi tharu niranjana latamani are few examples who have been considering the question of writing history from the feminist perspective and the issues rising out of it as a grassroots movement asian feminist theology began when asian women gathered to discuss the bible and their faith in the context of their lives and asian realities ever since the late 1970s asian Christian women have organized theological networks, convened ecumenical conferences, and began to publish books and journals contributing to feminist theologies emerging from the third world. Participating in this movement include social activists, churches, reformers, community, organizers, women priests, and religious women. academic theological student and lady leaders of the local churches beginning in the 1980s association of the theological trained women have been formed in various asian countries including korea taiwan indonesia india and philippines and ecumenical network have provided resources and support for the cross fertilization of ideas and critical dialogues although feminist theologians in asia are few in numbers they have significant contribution to their churches and to the global feminist theological movement development of eco theology the ecological crisis is so great in the asian countries especially in india our oil case inhabitant world is on a survival threat as there is a depletion of resources accompanied by the sound pollution air pollution water pollution and soil pollution the go the global warming in its alarming rate is increasing which makes the life of other living creatures difficult and not only human eco theology has emerged as theologians have wrestled with several challenges according to sebastian c h king there are four points for doing eco theology firstly the critique of traditional theologies which are accused of being anthro anthropocentric and androcentric secondly it's on the recent ecological crisis global warming nuclear accident natural calamities due to mismanagement of natural resources water and air pollution thirdly the failure of traditional theologies to respond to the problem of the ecosystem and their silence in the face of western development and technology models which have been the main contributing factors to the present crisis and fourthly the encounter of the people and philosophies of other religions and primal spiritualities moreover eco theology is a form of constructive theology that focuses on the interrelationship of religion and nature particularly in the light of environmental concern eco theology generally starts from the premise that a uh, exist between human religious spirituality worldwide and degradation of nature on the other hand eco theology has opened new way of theologizing to meet the ecological crisis and has contributed a great deal for understanding of the relationship of god human kind and nature specifically Eco theology seeks not only to identify prominent 
is within the relationship between nature and religion but also to outline potential solution.